Okay, hi everybody and welcome to the first webinar. Uh, this is an introduction to physical activity. Um, so this is actually one of many webinars that you can or shortly will be able to find available on the Public Health Resource Centre. Uh, so as an introduction to start, my name is Stephen Turrell. I'm a, I work in Public Health at Leeds City Council specifically on physical activity and I'll let my colleague introduce herself. And I'm Emma Geary. Uh, I work across Public Health and Active Leeds on the physical activity agenda. Super, thanks, Simon. So on today's webinar, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a rundown as to what we plan to um, talk about today. So first of all, we want to talk about what physical activity is. So as the definition of physical activity, because we know that can be confusing sometimes. We're going to look at Leeds and whether Leeds is an active city. And we're going to look at what the current guidelines are. And they're the national guidelines that come from Public Health England. Emma, are you going to, do you want to talk through the, what else we're going to cover today? Yeah, of course. Um, so then we're going to go into the health benefits um, and not just the health benefits, but the benefits to, so, so, to our social side and our environment as well. Um, we're going to talk about the barriers. So what stops people from being active um, and look at some of the solutions. So what helps people to be active as well? And then actually some um, information on what you can do to get started and what you can do to help others get started with physical activity. Great, thank you. OK, so Stephen, can you first take us through what is physical activity and what does it actually mean? Yeah, absolutely. So physical activity, obviously, there's lots of different terms, lots of different language uh, used. So what we wanted to do was start off by kind of making sure everyone had a good understanding of what actually physical activity was. So the most commonly used definition or the one we see the most comes from the World Health Organization uh, and they define physical activity as any bodily movement which is carried out by skeletal muscles, so uh, the, any, your muscles, main muscles in your body that require energy. So you get energy from food obviously. Um, now obviously Examples of this might include walking, cycling, uh, shopping, where you're carrying uh, your bag, uh, shopping bags, anything like that. Um, but importantly, something that does get conf quite often confused is this term exercise. So how do physical activity and exercise differ? Well, actually, exercise is a subcategory of physical activity. So people that do exercise tend to seek it out. They, they go there with the intention of um, exercising to improve fitness um, or, or, or and it's, it tends to be organized so when you go to for example a spinning class or you go to a gym class uh, that for example is an example of exercise whereas physical activity might be taken up as just as part of daily life like I said like walking to the shops or cycling or or carrying shopping doing gardening that kind of thing so you can hopefully see the difference there another term that we quite often see used is the term sedentary or you hear sedentary behaviour, and that refers to a, a lack of movement over a long period of time. So, for example, people spent sitting or laying down. And when you think about that in in daily life, you kind of you realise that the way the way we move around and the way we work, the way our homes are set up, all kind of lead towards this sedentary behaviour. Um, so we go to work, we sit in the office, we sit at computers uh, and we're sedentary. We go home, we sit on sofas, we drive our cars, we're sedentary and, and all this discourages movement. So that's what physical activity is. Emma, in Leeds, what's the, what's the picture at the moment? What's it look like? Yeah, so in Leeds, we know from um, both national data and some local data as well that approximately one in five adults living in Leeds are inactive. And this increases our risk of developing long-term conditions. So in this 20%, this one in five adults, we know that there are certain demographics that are more typically going to be inactive. We know these as women and girls, people with long-term conditions or a disability, and some BAME groups as well. Um, and like I said, this has come from some local data. So we... Um, We've branded these slides, Get Set Leads, you might have noticed. Um, and Get Set Leads was all about having a conversation last year in 2019 with people in these, trying to get to these inactive groups to find more information from them about being active and why they're not active and what we can do to improve their situation. So we know from both national and local data um, about these groups now. 
That's great, Emmett. We're gonna, I'm going to talk now a little bit about the national guidance for physical activity. And on this slide, you'll see that I've listed um, six guidance documents. So whilst you're probably more familiar with one, there are actually six which outline um, what physical activity we should be doing by different groups. So, for example, children up to five years old, children and young adults have very different or slightly different guidelines, I should say, to that of adults and older adults. We've also got uh, guidance for disabled adults. We've got uh, guidance for pregnant women. We've got guidance for women after childbirth. Um, and all this guidance comes from Public Health England. It comes from the Chief Medical Officer and it follows uh, quite a rigorous process in terms of like actually looking at the research, looking at the evidence base um, to find out what what different populations or what different people should be doing to get the most benefit from physical activity. Now, for the purpose of this webinar, because we don't want to just skim over all of them, we're actually going to talk just about the, the guidance for adults and older adults and disabled adults. But like I said, there will be other webinars which in the future which will look specifically at the at different guidance documents. So if you are looking for information on children or you're looking for information on pregnant women and physical activity, you will be able to access that information later on. Okay, so this is the most commonly used infographic to explain the guidelines for um, adults and older adults. So what we're going to do is walk through this in a little bit of detail to explain it um, step by step. So if we look at the green area for now, which is at the top, it says 150 minutes or 75 minutes, depending on whether you're doing moderate intensity or vigorous intensity exercise over the course of seven days. And that can be quite confusing in itself and quite a lot to, to take in at once. So we're going to break that down a little bit. Um, if I can ask Stephen to first walk us through what, what does actually moderate and vigorous activity actually mean and entail? So, yeah, I suppose a really good starting point is just to point out that for one person, moderate intensity physical activity will be different to another person. And the same goes for vigorous intensity. Everyone has their own different levels of what they find intensive for physical activity. Now, the way that we tend to uh, determine whether someone's doing moderate physical activity versus vigorous is kind of just through like breathing rate. So if you are doing moderate intensity physical activity, you'll you'll start breathing a little bit harder, you'll you'll start to warm up, but you'll still be able to talk. So you'd still be able to have a, a conversation with somebody else. In comparison, if you're doing vigorous intensity physical activity, you'll be breathing significantly faster and you'd find it a lot more difficult to have a conversation if someone else was doing it with you so they're kind of the most simple ways of making a comparison between the two so moderate intensity slightly uh, increased breathing vigorous intensity significantly harder breathing and you'd have difficulty talking yeah that's great um, and remember your weekly allowance of 150 minutes or 75 minutes um, can be a combination of both you don't have to do it all at the same time um, and every minute counts. There's, uh, there was a recent change in the last update on the guidelines um, that every minute counts towards your 150 minutes or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity. And those 150 minutes may seem a big goal to try and reach if you're just starting out. So it's good to remember that, that some is good and more is better, and it's never too late to start and if you don't hit that 150 minutes in the first week, then it's something to just keep working on week on week. Absolutely. And one of the other changes we've seen since the guidance changed in 2019 was this real emphasis on the importance of building strength. So building strength to keep muscles, bones and joints strong. Uh, and ways people can do that are through kind of going to the gym, which is more your exercise, like I talked about previously or doing things, daily activities like carrying heavy, heavy bags, whether that's going to the shop or, or doing gardening. You'll also see at the bottom of the graphic on the screen that there's also emphasis on minimising sedentary time. So again, we talked about that, breaking up periods of inactivity where we might be sat in an office or sat at home on the sofa. Um, and for older adults in particular, this emphasis on improving balance two days a week to reduce reduce the chance of frailty and falls which are just part of the natural aging process. So we've just been talking about the guidelines for adults and older adults um, and we wanted to go through the differences for disabled adults and um, so Stephen can you take us through what the differences are? Yeah so I mean 
this there's not a, a massive difference between the guidance for adults and older adults and disabled adults the, the kind of standout for me it talks about uh, moderate intensity activity so if you remember moderate intensity activities where you are breathing slightly heavier but you're still able to have that conversation what you see missing from this guideline is that there's no vigorous intensity activity so it very much uh, recommends moderate um, there's obviously a big focus on uh, kind of having fun improving mental health and quality of life about it creating opportunities to meet with new people so it feels like the guidelines for disabled adults are much more around kind of social interaction having fun as well so they're kind of the standout things that i see in this we can also see like the previous one that there's an emphasis on strength and balance with the aim of achieving this on two days per week um so emma we've talked a lot about what the guidelines are uh, what are the benefits of being physically active yeah, absolutely. So when we think about the benefits, we quite often think about the health benefits to our body. Um, so on here, we can see on this infographic that we can see that there's proven benefit or reducing the risk of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, falls, depression, joint, back pain and some cancers, all from varying 20 to 40 percent, depending on the condition. Um, it can also improve our overall quality of life, making us feel better, not just affecting our levels of depression and anxiety, but that feel good factor when we do exercise. It can help us manage stress and maintain a, a good healthy weight, um, as well as improving our sleep as well. And this is all part of a, a healthy lifestyle, just one part of it. We also need to remember that um, we should be eating well based on the eat well guide and uh, remember to drink plenty of water and if we're increasing our physical activity levels to ensure that we're we're drinking enough to stay hydrated as well. Yeah absolutely that's a really good point there and I think it's also important to acknowledge that quite often when we hear people talk about physical activity it refers to you as an individual or the benefits to you but actually the benefits are a lot wider so we know that uh, physical activity it has huge benefits for like, socially in terms of like bringing communities together getting people to interact um, and we also know that our, there are environmental benefits so for example things like air quality because if we can get people out of cars and start getting people to cycle or or walk when they're commuting or traveling to different places they're just wider benefits or some of the wider benefits that can be um, achieved so we know that physical activity is important to the individual to uh, social and to the environment but Emma can you talk through some of the the common barriers that we see in Leeds? Yeah definitely and just like we were saying earlier about what's the local um, levels of physical activity in Leeds looking like we we know from national data as well as local data through things like the Big Leeds chat as well as the Get Set Leeds conversation um, that these barriers are in existence in our in our local communities so um, we know that there's uh, concerns that people don't know where to begin or where to find the information that's relevant to them and also local to them. Um, we know that time is always a barrier and fitting it into your everyday life. Just trying to get to uh, gym classes and things, but also um, trying to work around our family life and those constraints as well as benefits that that brings there's barriers around obviously culture and religion um, which can uh, have an impact and effect on our physical activity levels uh, we also know that that cost for example is a, is a barrier to people as well um, not just for the accessing of classes, but if we think wider than that in terms of um, transportation, whether that's a personal car or public transport, um, as well as kit and equipment to take part in different things. And we also know that um, certain health conditions can create barriers for people or perceived barriers for people. Um, and I've already mentioned the, the family one, but that is wider in terms of access, for example, with women, with children uh, and childcare, or if they've got push chairs, um, you know, even uh, using transportation or 
uh, going for a walk or a jog uh, with a pushchair can have its limitations as well. So we've just been talking about some of the barriers, um, but how do we overcome these or how do we help people to overcome these? Yeah, so there are, there are a real range of things that we can, we can do both as organisations but also as individuals. So as organisations, well, as both organisations and individuals, I suppose, a, a big emphasis is put on time. So if you are in responsibility in a workplace for kind of setting people's agendas and giving people time, the more flexibility we can give people typically, the more physically active they feel able to be. Uh, so I think that's really important. Like we've mentioned information and access to information is something that is incredibly important um, ultimately if people don't know where to find uh, something that's relevant to them or accessible for them they're not going to be able to be physically active so i think it's really important to make sure that information is up to date people can access it both online for people that maybe aren't online getting it in other formats i think that's really important we know, like I've mentioned, that social and environmental factors are also important when it comes to physical activity. So as you can see on this slide, things like where you live, uh, the people that are around you and uh, green space are all also important factors. So we know that if people are um, have friends or have groups around them that are also act active and, and encourage activity, um, then that's really beneficial. And things like green space around you, if you can go to a park or if you can go out into the garden again, really beneficial to help people be active but at the same time i think it's important to say that if you are if you are someone that doesn't perhaps have um a garden or you don't have a park at the end of the street because not everyone is that fortunate then there are still lots of opportunities out there to be physically active um and like i've said like i said at the start that's about information about flexibility and about thinking th about things a little bit different and there are loads of resources out there which we'll talk through at the end of this uh, webinar to help people or uh, either individually or for you to help other people that you might be working with so how do i get started and how does this all become a reality Stephen? well i think Ultimately, people just need to have conversations about physical activity and almost not be scared of just kind of encouraging it and giving something new a try. I think have a conversation with friends, with family, with your GP, with your health professional. Just start the ball rolling. And if you are struggling to get active, then that's fine. I think a lot of people are in the same boat and there's nothing wrong with that. I also think people need to think about finding something that motivates you to be active. So you might see lots of resources out there online, which seem really good, but actually... If it's, a, if it's a short period of time, it's not something you enjoy, you might struggle to get long-term benefit out of that. So find something you enjoy and find something that motivates you because you're probably more likely to stick to it. I think when you're setting out as well, this kind of links to it. It's really important to set goals. So we talk about goals that are kind of like specific, measurable, attainable, if you like. Realistic, I think realistic is a massive one for physical activity. Don't, don't go setting goals like running marathons when perhaps actually a more realistic goal might just be doing a five minute walk and that's absolutely fine if that's your starting point and again remember something's better than nothing I think that's a good point to go to there remember something's better than nothing and if you are someone that's really enthusiastic about physical activity and wants to kind of have a wider benefit to your community maybe you want your friends and family to do to be more active or just kind of have have some influence on what goes on around you then you could become a mover and shaker which is part of Get Set Leads and Emma's going to talk about that right now yeah so um as part of Get Set Leads, um, we started this um, movement, if you will, um, inviting people to become uh, what's called a movers and shaker. Um, we've actually got a really good video already that explains all of this. Um, so we'll press play on that now so you can hear our colleague Sally Hall actually explaining this in a lot more detail. So Get Set Leads is a partnership of people from across the city who would love to see the city become more active and movers and shakers are an important part of making that happen. Get Set Leads is all about working together to make changes happen in the city, to build um, a place where people can get out and about and move more. Movies and Shakers are people with great ideas for how Leeds could be a more active city who know that being active is great for your well-being, good for communities and good for the city as a whole but who also know it's not easy to be active every day. Movers and Shakers 
come from all walks of life and all parts of the city um, and to come together to talk to people that they know about the benefits of being active and to share good ideas about things that could change in the city to support people to move more. Movers and Shakers talk to their friends about it, they share things on social media and they share information about what's happening out there that will give people the chance to get more active. So if you're interested in being a mover and shaker, check out the Get Set Leads website, www.getsetleads.co.uk and sign up to be a mover and shaker or just stay in touch with us through our mailing list. It'll be great to hear from you. So I hope that video was really helpful and insightful for everybody today. This brings us to the final slide in today's webinar. Now, as you can see, for more information, there's a whole host of links here, which you can visit and, and, and explore in your own time. But just to explore, or just to point out a few of them that you might want to pay particular attention to, at the bottom we have Active Leads and One New Leads. Both of these are major service providers in Leeds where you can find a whole host of activities both online and in your local community. So I highly recommend everyone checks them out in their own time. Like I said, that ends today's webinar and I really hope you found that helpful and enjoyable at the same time. Thanks for listening and we look forward to speaking to you soon.